really delighted to be able to welcome you to TipTech. Um, it's just very exciting to be meeting again under the banner of TipTech in person for the first time since 2019. And I'm particularly thrilled to be able to share a genuinely packed agenda for the next two days. We've got over 70 speakers, 180 attendees from 33 countries. And it's also brilliant to be able to live stream TipTech for the first time for people who can't attend in person. So particularly welcome uh, to those of you joining on the live stream. I'm gonna start with a little bit of housekeeping. So we're going to be using Slido uh, to take questions throughout the sessions here in Mary Ward House and in the Herschel room, as well as having roaming mics. So um, you can use the barcode on the left of the screen here to get into Slido, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code 1248242, -242, and then you need to choose which room you're in, and you're in the Mary Ward Hall now, and otherwise you can check the program for which room you're in, the conference schedule. Uh, you can also upvote other people's questions on Slido as well, and that is really helpful in making sure that we get the questions that are most useful to the people in the room asked when we have limited time. Um, over the last few years, we have run TicTech as an online program, and I'll talk a bit about what we've learned about that in a minute. But online or in person, TicTech is where we talk about uh, what works when we try and use technology to distribute power rather than to concentrate it. So when we use technology to strengthen public participation, transparency, and accountability. TicTech has always been driven by a combination of the head and the heart. We want to evaluate the evidence base for the impact of civic technology, but we also want to build and maintain the community that's absolutely vital to delivering that impact, uh, often with incredible persistence, commitment, and ingenuity in the face of extremely adverse circumstances. Uh, the encouragement that a set of friends and colleagues around the world who don't think that what you're doing is crazy can be a very powerful thing. Given the interval in in-person meetings, uh, and as we come up incredibly to the 10th year of Tic Tech conferences next year, we wanted to use this as an opportunity to take stock a little bit and to invite you all to think with us about what we're going to need to meet the big challenges of the next decades. Uh, and that's the reason why we've given this year's conference a subtitle, which is Climate, AI, and Democracy Under Threat really to reflect the challenges of the present moment and also ask what they can tell us about risks and opportunities for the future. It does feel like a significantly different context that we're meeting in than we did in Paris in 2019. Aside from a global pandemic, we're seeing long-running threats to democracy mutating into new forms. Uh, corruption, disengagement, closing civil society space, violent conflict, polarization, misinformation, populism, and authoritarianism, you can run off your own personal laundry list. And we're feeling the threat, uh, the currents of these threats to democracy across all jurisdictions. Uh, but when I say that, I hear the voice of our chair of trust trustees, Jen Maitland Hudson, in my head saying, ah, but Louise, people mean very different things when they say the word democracy. And that's right. Uh, we've got different democratic systems, different contexts around the world, and that means that we're experiencing these threats in very specific ways. And one of the reasons I think it's particularly important, uh, one of the reasons I think that's particularly important to recognize when we're thinking about the impact of civic tech is that scale of reach is one of the things that technology can really offer. And as a sector, civic tech has made a lot of use of open source licenses which mean that we can actually share the code uh, that we use around the world. And when that does work, it can be a huge force multiplier. Speaking from our own experience, uh, my society has had uh, projects, uh, their code reused by projects in 87 uh, places around the world. 48 of those are still running today. And as we pass our 20th anniversary as an organization, that includes at least a dozen services around the world that have now been running for more than a decade. 
but we know that doesn't always work. Uh, and one of the things I think we've learned as a field is that context is hugely important when it comes to applying approaches or code that's been developed elsewhere. Uh, one of the reasons we run Tech Tech is to provide opportunities to discuss why a particular approach works in a particular context and what that means for whether and why it might be applied elsewhere. 2024, as we all know, is a year in which many people are sharing common democratic experience, having a national election. Uh, those elections are happening in more than 80 countries, affecting the futures of more than half the world's population. But we know that voting isn't the sole measure of democratic health. And one of the lessons I take from the past few years is that the everyday quality of our democracies isn't something we can be complacent about anywhere. So I'm particularly delighted that we're going to be hearing from speakers not only who work to safeguard elections, but also addressing those broader questions of democratic and civic health, talking about the challenges of navigating the uncertainty of building civic tech in closing and conflict-affected spaces, approaches to applying civic tech in crisis situations, and analyses of digital tech when it's used to protect human rights. I'm also delighted that we're going to be looking at what we can and can't generalize. So looking at multi-country approaches and trying to draw out common needs and challenges. I'm really happy that the use of uh, digital tools to support deliberation has emerged as a theme. Um, when we first started to encounter deliberative approaches, I thought they were really exciting, but I, didn't, I realized I didn't really understand what the word meant. Uh, and one of the most helpful definitions that I've come across is communication between people as if engaged in a common problem. And it seems to me that engagement in a common problem is really at the heart of the idea of civics. We're surrounded now by digital tools that connect us online at scale, but the ability to connect people in a way that encourages and enables them to engage in common problem solving is a real differentiator, in my view, between truly civic tech and what we might think of as connection wash. Along with responding to the challenges of the moment, I think our approach to understanding impact has to recognize the way in which our own field has developed. So I wanted to give a brief catch up on Tick Tech in the post-pandemic years. After taking our planned Reykjavik conference online extremely hastily in March 2020, we've experimented with how we can best support the field with a series of online seminars and show and tell sessions. And more recently, with the support of the National Endowment for Democracy, we took a new approach in the form of Tick Tech Labs, which was an online program where we were aiming to bring civic tech and other stakeholders together. We worked with participants to try and identify common challenges and needs and gaps in the evidence base across the field. And then uh, through Action Labs, uh, we had working groups who were tasked with identifying potential solutions and commissioning small projects to benefit the whole community. But one of the positive developments in the sector as it's grown is the differentiation of civic tech, which used to be a very small community where you knew all the friendly faces, into one which encompasses broad genres of tool and approach. And you can see this in resources that are intended to support the organizational memory of civic tech. So things like the Civic Tech Field Guide, the Tick Tech Resource Hub. Uh, so it's exciting. The field's now matured to the point where we're seeing multiple instances of tools that do similar things. And I think that enables both closer collaboration, but also more meaningful like-for-like -like comparison of approaches, uh, which I think is potentially very useful in evaluating and building on impact. So building on the experiment of the Tic Tech Labs format and on an appetite from the people who are involved for getting deeper, uh, deeper into collaboration, uh, through the course of this year, we're running two online communities of practice around tools based on parliamentary and legislative tracking and access to information and freedom of information, two areas that we actively work on at my society. Uh, and the goal is that with these online communities of practice running between Tick Techs, we can better connect practitioners in these areas and prime topics for discussion, Tick Tech this year and Tick Tech next year. And we're extremely grateful to NED for enabling this work and also for supporting Tick Tech. Uh, many thanks also too to Gemma Mulder, Alex Parsons, and Jen Bramley and the whole My Society team for making Tick Tech and the Communities of Practice happen. They are here today in red t-shirts if you have any questions uh, or concerns. 
Um, and over the next two days, I'm really looking forward to hearing about projects in parliamentary and legislative tracking and access to information from contexts as diverse as Brazil, Poland, Nigeria, Georgia, South Africa, and Thailand. We're also going to be sharing our own experiences, and we'd be really delighted to hear of any other projects in these fields that we, we aren't already in touch with. As an aside, when I was writing my notes for this introduction, I kept wanting to use the phrase comparing apples to oranges, talking about comparing different tools and approaches. And I, uh, I went down a little Wikipedia rabbit hole uh, on the page for apples to oranges as a phrase, which lists all the equivalent phrases in different languages. Uh, and Romanian arguably wins, as it allegedly has both uh, comparing the grandmother and the machine gun and also the cow and the long johns. So uh, if you want a nerdy icebreaker for the coffee break, you can go and find someone from another country and see if they've got a local version of that phrase. Uh, coming back to the agenda, I'm excited about the chance to compare tools and approaches, but I think if we're serious about growing impact, we have to acknowledge that technology projects don't happen in a vacuum. We can't just look at the qualities and merits of tools themselves, but we have to look at a broader set of questions that can enable or constrain impact. How to sustain impactful projects over time is a key practical question, and that brings into scope the further question of how to sustain civic tech organizations into mini institutions that are capable of learning, adapting, and evolving, and what kind of ecosystems are needed around them which in turn leads to the question of institutional support or opposition and of sustainable funding models. All of these factors contribute to the longer stories of impact that we need to understand, of who projects reach, why they fail, and why they last. Part of being in a field that's no longer in its infancy also means addressing new challenges that longevity brings. Again, those challenges are diverse. Uh, for example, this afternoon, we're gonna hear perspectives from Egypt, on how to sustain civic tech projects after an initial burst of post-revolution growth, and from the UK on what to do when your projects are unexpectedly adopted as national infrastructure. It's a sad truth that many valuable projects are still undercut by the absence of basic enabling infrastructure, and so we're going to also hear reflections uh, from diverse organizations uh, who are involved with digital infrastructure, including the OECD, Taiwan's Ministry of Digital Affairs, and Germany's new Sovereign Tech Fund. We also have sessions across the agenda, and particularly tomorrow, looking at the final two pieces of the puzzle that we're faced with. The urgency of climate response and the potential step-changing capabilities brought by artificial intelligence. In short, the challenges are great. Uh, there's a lot for us to talk about but no place I would rather be than in a room full of people uh, who are multi-skilled and multidisciplinary and actively working for positive change.